Well, good morning, Southside Bible Church. And as Greg already did, special welcome to anyone who's visiting us here for the first time. We are always grateful to have you with us and our family to worship together. A uh, special greeting to those who are live streaming as well. You are very missed and uh, getting reports of those whose churches are not opened and you're live streaming. And we, we pray that um, in God's timing, your churches would open uh, soon where you could gather together again to worship. Well, as a church, we've been studying through the book of Romans. If you'll turn there, uh, last time we were together, we finished up chapter Five, and that was a, a really a major section. We spent our first year together in Romans and finished that up. So I'm just going to go back to chapter one where we began a year ago and just read it again. Paul, a bond servant of Christ Jesus, called as an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, the gospel which he promised beforehand through his prophets and the Holy Scriptures. And this Old Testament has told us about this gospel, and it's a gospel concerning his son, and a son who was, was born of a virgin, who was born of a descendant of David according to the flesh, but was marked off and declared the son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead according to the spirit of holiness, Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom we've received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith among all the Gentiles for his name's sake. And so Paul is desiring to, to lead any into the obedience of faith, believing this gospel and living this gospel. And he concludes, uh, I'm eager to come and preach this to all. I'm a debtor to all men because of this gospel saved a, a, a one like me who was killing Christians. And he said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel for it's the dunamis the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and to the Greek. For in this gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith as it is written, the righteous man shall live by faith. And so we've learned of a gospel that can take us out from under the wrath of God and, and clothe us in, in the righteousness of Christ and bring us acceptable in, in the favor of God. And then Paul begins his gospel, and for three chapters he showed the condemnation that the wrath of God is upon all of humanity, whether you're religious or irreligious, moral or immoral. The wrath of God is upon you because you're suppressing God. Uh, the Jews, you have the law. You're telling everyone how to live, but you're disobeying it yourself. And so religious people, uh, immoral people, we're all under the wrath of God, and we need to be saved. And then we came to Romans 3.21, but now... The transition then is this is what God has done to reconcile this problem. And the remedy is in his son, Jesus Christ, who came and lived the life that we should have and died the death that we deserved. And Paul showed again and again that it's by faith and not by your works. It's by believing in what God has done, not by you working up some kind of morality to get this salvation. Then we moved into Romans 5 and we began looking at the fruits of justification, Paul says, I exalt three times. I exalt in my hope of glory. This gospel will bring me to glory. I exalt in my tribulations because tribulations cause me to quit hoping in this world and to hope in the gospel that's coming. And I need to be squeezed and I need trials and I need tribulations to keep growing this hope for this coming to you grace of God that we all should have our hope fixed and set on Comfort and ease does not produce hope. It causes you to put your tent stakes down and try to make America your, your paradise. And so thank you, God, for 2020, for tribulations to cause us to hope in this glory. And then my favorite one is, he says, I just exult in God. I exult in a gospel that has reconciled me to God. And nothing else, I exult in God. And then we scanned redemptive history with both Adams. We saw the first Adam in the garden was a representative head. And when he sinned, he took all of us with us. And the second Adam came into this world and his act of righteousness now will be put to our account and his death on a cross in our place. And we can now be reconciled to this God. And all of this is to bring about the obedience of faith that you would believe it. And so I, I say this again and again, it's a shame that I've got to call the church to believe this. 
but there are those who come here every Sunday and you don't believe this. And you're trying to just be good people and be religious and clean yourself up. Five chapters, one year. The obedience of faith is God has called you to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. And so I pray that everyone in this room has called upon that name to deliver and to save you from the wrath that is to come. This morning, we're going to begin a crucial new section now in Paul's letter. We're going to begin looking at chapters 6 through 8. This is the obedience now that faith produces in the one who believes this gospel. So when you are justified, this is going to bring about now the obedience of faith. And we're going to begin looking and showing how justification and being made right with God is the foundation of how we're now going to grow and be conformed into the image of Christ. The first Adam, he brought original sin. He brought separation from God and he brought a a nature now that's turned into itself. Instead of Godward bent, we have an inward bent. We have self as a center reference point and a very nature now that is is against God and his law and for our own self rule. And, and Paul said the death that spread to all men when Adam sinned. And what I want you to see is that you were brought in now by Adam under the dominion and the rule and the reign of sin. We're all born into this world under that realm. We, we, we have a dominion called sin. He's our ruler. He's reigning over all who will ever be born from the seed of Adam. In Romans 3, 9, it said we are all under sin. And that Greek word we saw was the the dominion of sin. So every one of us are born under this dominion. And therefore, the wrath of God is upon us. And there's our great predicament. We get to spend 2021 now as a family, as a church, learning then how do we live as justified believers? How do we begin the transformation that grace brings about? I want you to see that Paul keeps describing grace as a power. In Romans 5, 2, he said we stand in it now. We are now brought in to, the, to this realm called grace, the power of God. In Romans 5, 21, it's, it's a reign in our life now. And so therefore, as we begin, I want you to see we have everything necessary for life and godliness because we've been brought out from under the realm and reign of sin to the rule and reign of righteousness of Christ our King. And so I'm going to ask you to to pray with me for God to meet us in 2021 in power with the power of grace to transform every person in this church. And my passion is that no one would be left behind, that all of you would obey the obedience of faith, you would believe this gospel. And that now in faith, you would begin to be conformed to the image of Christ. And so we we, we lock hands and we lock shields to, to help each other take the steps individually and corporately into conformity to Jesus Christ. God's designed it where we need each other. We need him and we need each other to help us in growing into conformity to Jesus Christ. And as Greg read this morning in these new covenants, if you've been born again, you have to have desires for conformity to Christ or holiness or you're dead in your sins. The new birth will produce. So every heart should be saying, Romans 1 through 5 is so beautiful. Can, how do I grow? How do I please a God who would do that for me in his son? And so that's what 2021 is, that we would all come here and just say, I want to grow. I want to be conformed to Christ because of what God has done for me in Christ. That's the obedience of faith. So what I would like to do as we start 2021 is I want you to to join with me and I want you to pray with me. I I want to go before God and ask him to do this in every heart. And so let's go to our God and pray together. Father, we come corporately as a local assembly, Southside Bible Church. And I thank you that we've been purchased with the blood of Christ. And I pray no one in here would take that lightly. Royal divine blood that was shed in our place on a cross. And God, I thank you that we've been clothed in the righteous garment of Jesus Christ. That we are perfectly righteous standing before you this morning because of Christ's life. God, I thank you that you've justified us. 
I thank you that we stand before you now not guilty when we were so guilty and we are accepted and adopted and loved by you. And Father, a new year, and it comes on the heels of a a very hard one in which you did mighty things in our midst, breaking down idols in the high places of our heart. And our hope is not, God, make things back to the way they were, but make us like your Son. As we behold him, God, conform us to his image. To where all he did was the things that were pleasing to you, I pray that we would be those men, women, and children who seek to only do the things that please you. And it will take a power that we don't possess in and of ourselves so we join together in prayer and dependence on you asking God that you would do that in every heart in this place. And you call for discipline and the means of grace. And I pray that we would be diligent in them. But God, we live in complete dependence upon you. Means will never grow us. Only you will. And so I pray that we would seek these means of prayer and fellowship and worship and the sacraments and fasting. God, I pray that we would be diligent in these and knowing that you are the only one who can grow us. And so we we seek these means to behold more of you and that your power would transform and change us. For apart from you, we can do nothing. We, We join our hearts together and cry before you. Apart from you, we know we can do nothing. We can't grow ourselves. And so we cry for the grace that rules and reigns in our lives. And so I pray for this body, O God. I pray for those who are just weary, their knees are out of joint. God, I pray that you would strengthen them. I pray for those who are just discouraged. God, I pray, fill them with their blessed hope. I pray for those who don't know what we're about to study that this time in the Word would be mighty to transform and change them. I pray for those who are just drowsy. The effects of 2020 have just made them sleepy towards you. I pray, God, wake them up. Wake them up and get them ready for the coming King. I pray for all those in this church who have just made peace with sin. God, don't let them do that. It's against all of your gospel, against all of where you're moving us. Let no one in this room have peace with sin. God, wake us up from it. Cause a holy revulsion against everything that's contrary to you and your will. God, I pray for all those who, um, all their discipline and all their hard work has produced nothing but pride and no conformity to Christ. And that they would look again to you and your beauty and your power and what you can do versus their own hands. I pray for those who are being tempted to go back into this world of destruction. I pray, God, let them see the beauty and glory of Christ. Where else can they go? God, show them again. And I pray for those who are tired of loving other people with different views on COVID and government. God, revive our love for one another. Revive our love for you. Father, we live in a world that needs the church to live like Jesus Christ more than ever and to make them thirst for him because of the beauty of what they see in us. God, 2021, let us be that. Let us be different than anything in this world. Let us not be conformed to this world. God, let us be transformed and changed and Christ to this world. Let us be very different than in a world that's passing away and all of its hope is here. God, do that mighty work in our midst, I pray, in 2021. In the name of Jesus Christ, we ask these things. Amen. This morning, we're going to spend a good amount of time setting this diamond of chapter 6 on its prongs. And so it's so important that we understand how it fits in. And so it's no exaggeration that the majority of my counseling is those who don't make the transition rightly from chapters 1 through 5 to chapter 
6. This is the devil's playground. This is where he tries to destroy the children of God and make them ineffective to give God glory. Romans 2, Paul says the name of God is blasphemed, Jews, because of you. And so we need to understand this, that we're not the ones blaspheming the name of God out there in this world. And so we're going to focus hard this morning on making sure that we make this transition rightly and understand it. And so as we begin, we're going to look at several things. I wanted to just start with my own testimony about Romans 6. Not because I, you care about my own testimony, but I think there's something in it that could encourage you. I was saved in college in 1987. <clears throat> I was shot out of a cannon. I remember driving to my baptism. I was listening to this. Most of you won't even remember this guy's name. His name was Wayne Watson. And I'm driving, and, and the song is saying, man, I want to take the narrow way. I, I don't want the broader way as easy as it seems. I, I want the narrow way. And I remember just going, Jesus, I just want to take the narrow way and follow you with the rest of the days of my life. I'm ready to publicly testify with you. And I just remember early on, I bought this big, huge Strong's Concordance. It's, it's huge. Now I, I want Kelsey to put it on her first date between you and your the guy that you'll be with is just ma massive. So, so glad you were here. I, I wouldn't have been able to use that if you weren't here. So I bet you're glad you're here too, huh, sweetie? Be, being a pastor's daughter is a hard thing. So, so I just began studying that Bible with fervor and, and going to every Bible study our church had and prayer meetings. And uh, church was everything to me. I did more moves than any man could do in a year and I just had such a passion for holiness. It just overtook my heart. And then on college, there was this uh, group on my college campus. And I, I joined it. And, and one of the leaders gave me a pamphlet. And it was called The Spirit-Filled Life. And if anyone wanted The Spirit-Filled Life, it was me. And as I began opening it, there were a couple pictures of, of, of a throne. And on the first one, it had self sitting on the throne. And Jesus was off of it. And that was kind of the unbeliever. And then the other one was what was called a carnal Christian, which from Corinthians is not a status. There's not such a thing as a carnal Christian. There's a Christian being rebuked for being carnal. But this was a whole new category. You could be a carnal Christian. And then the, the other one had Jesus on the throne and self off of it. And that was called the spirit-filled life, where every thought and every deed was Christ on the throne. <clears throat> and spirit-filled living was all of your selfish desires and sin have been taken off. And, and so now you have a life where Jesus rules and reigns it. And so you, you inhale scripture and you exhale self. And that's the spirit-filled life. And so I was so excited to go do this. And all my sinful desires were, were, would be gone. And I would just love and serve Christ and he would rule my life. And so that was the best news I could have ever heard. And so you can imagine, uh, as I began, I was all about it. And I began doing this, and it was amazing. I was like, man, I'm growing like crazy. And then something hard started to happen. I realized that I couldn't get rid of all of my selfish heart. I couldn't live the Spirit-filled life no matter how hard I tried. I had these desires that were contrary in me to the things of God that I just couldn't breathe in and breathe out. It wasn't going away. It seemed that when I exhaled, the sin just wasn't going off. Self wasn't getting all the way out of there. And I just kept trying harder and harder. And the more I learned, the worse it got because I was learning more and more what God required of me. So it was just growing into this bigger, bigger chasm. And it led me into despair. Am I even a Christian at all is where I started falling on my face and wondering. And no one else seemed to be struggling fakers. <laughs> they were all happy and they just looked like perfect Christians and they were living the spirit-filled life that I was trying to find. And I can't begin to tell you the depression that started to set in. The sorrow that the, the one who died for my sins, I just couldn't quit sinning against no matter how hard I tried. I just couldn't get self all the way out of my life. I felt like a slave to sin. And Romans 6 is telling me that I'm not. 
and I wanted to give up, but I knew I couldn't because my eternal soul was at stake. And the old way of life had made me so miserable. And now this new way of life wasn't helping a whole lot. And my evangelism started dying because it was like, come be miserable with me. It's not good evangelism. Here. And it was J.I. Packer who set me free by explaining from John Owen the exact same battle that he went through when he was about to lose his mind doing the same thing that I was doing, he found John Owen, volume six, The Great Puritan. It's a big, thick one. That'd be a good one for a date. And it was on sin and temptation, uh, which was an exposition of Romans chapter six through eight. And I learned that the spirit-filled life pamphlet was not biblical. And I began to study Romans six through eight with, I had these tapes that I had, eight tracks, Cassette, no cassette tapes. And they were by John MacArthur on Romans 6 through 8. S. Lewis Johnson, I got his tapes on it. John Stott wrote a book, Men Made New, expositing that. And J.I. Packer wrote a book, Keep in Step with the Spirit. And that is what I hope to unfold to you in the months ahead and maybe year. Sorry, but uh, it changed my life. And my, my prayer for you is that that's what it would do as we begin to journey together. And I realize that Romans 6 through 8 is not the super Christian. It's normative for all Christians. And it's how you live when you've been brought into union with Jesus Christ as you wait for your consummation for when he returns. And this one quote by Packer kind of summarized what I learned. He said, we, we need them, people, to realize and remember that the believer's holiness is a matter of learning to be in action what he already is in heart. It's, it's learning what you already are in heart and, and in truth and how to live out in action that reality. And so Romans 6, we're going to see, he keeps saying knowing. Knowing what we already are in Christ and how we live in light of it is how we're going to grow. And so what helped me considerably was to learn that Romans 6 was the normal Christian life. So what we're about to dig into, this is normal for every believer. And that the one who takes it very seriously will have the normative Christian life of indwelling sin that still remains. And it's fighting these holy desires that I have within my heart until I reach glory, I can't get rid of them by breathing in and breathing out, and no formula can get rid of it. Romans 8, we're going to learn how to mortify it by the Spirit and put it to death, but the Spirit-filled life in that pamphlet simply was not true. And I will never go to a place this side of glory where I don't have remaining rot dogging and fighting my new holy desires that God has put within me. It's a life-changing principle to get your arms around. You'll never be rid of that foe until glory. That's why you're going to be groaning for your redemption where this remaining sin will be done away with forever. Romans 8, though, you will put it to death by the Spirit of God. But its remaining influences and desires will be part of my experience until glory. And so I love what John MacArthur said. He said, if anyone comes up to you and says they're done with the battle with sin... Um, don't listen to them. They're lying. He said they're either, they're either lying or dead. Because <laughs> if you don't have the battle, you're lying or you're dead and you've been made perfect. <clears throat> so I learned that me being obedient in the Christian life with the pain of indwelling sin was normative and not the carnal Christian or an unbeliever. And so my prayer is that maybe someone in this room uh, needed to hear this. And I'm going to be fighting for your freedom this year to understand God's word about how we grow in our Christian faith. And so let's begin this morning. Um, Romans 6. I just A couple observations and then I'll kick out our outline. First, as I look at Romans 6, 7, and 8, <coughs> sin is the issue. So I hear people say, I don't like to talk about sin. <laughs> Romans 1 through 3 was all about sin and the wrath and condemnation that's on us as unbelievers because of sin. Sin was the issue before salvation. 
And sin is what is dealt with in justification. It's, it's dealt with. It, positionally, it's washed away. We're made right before God. But it's still the issue after salvation. Chapter uh, Romans 5, 12 through chapter 8, I want you to hear this. 44 times it mentions sin. 17 times in chapter 6. If you don't want to talk about sin, you're in the wrong thing. Okay? The, the Christian life is about overcoming God's grace, overcoming sin. Sin is the issue of our, of our life. And so it always amuses me and grieves me when I hear a pastor say, we don't talk about sin in this church. And <laughs> Close the doors. Sin is the issue. And there's a guilt that had to be dealt with in the gospel and justification. And there's a power of sin when you were in Adam that's got to be broken. And that's sanctification now that that's been broken and God's going to be growing us. And then the glory of this gospel is one day the presence of sin will be done away with forever and ever and ever in glory. So it, it is the gospel deals with sin. Sin is what separates us from God. Second, the context of this section. How can we be sure we're going to make it to glory after God justifies us? I still have sin. I'm, <clears throat> I'm still battling. How, how am I going to get to glory? And Romans 5 through 8 are, are the blessings of justification when God saves you. So nothing will stand between us going to glory as this three chapters, not even sin. Sin can't keep you from glory. Chapter 8, Paul's going to say, nothing created can separate you from God's love. <clears throat> so sin will not have dominion over you again. Grace will see to it. Romans 6.14 says, where is it? For sin shall not be master over you. For you're not under law, but under grace. Thirdly, I want to look at a working outline of chapter 6. So I just want to give you kind of a bird's eye view as we step into it. There are two questions that this whole chapter will hang on. Look with me in Romans 6, 1. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin <coughs> that grace might increase? And then we got in verse 15, the second question. What then? Shall we sin because we're not under law, but under grace? May it never be. So the first question is, should we continue in sin that grace might abound? It's in the negative. He's going to say, how can you who died to sin still live in it? And then in the positive is we're not under law, under grace. Should we just sin? He's going to say, you've been made alive to God. So one is you've died to sin. The other is you've been made alive to God. And in Romans 6.11 will be the first command in this whole section, this whole book of Romans. First command, reckon yourselves to be dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. And Paul's going to say, by the way, your baptism pictured all of that. So that's Paul's argument where we're going to go. And I want you to just catch one thing as we move on. These are realities. These are realities that sometimes they're not even felt, but we hold to them by faith. Do you remember when we studied justification? Sometimes you won't feel like you're justified. But by faith, I'm going to hold to it and I'm going to believe it. And many of you have learned how to fight for that in Romans 1 through 5, but have you learned how to fight for it in Romans 6? Even though I don't feel dead to sin, it's a reality for the believer. We've got to reckon it to be true. Fourthly, brings me to my next observation, is I want to, to look at this indicative, imperative motif, because it's going to be very important to our Christian lives. <clears throat> One of the most important things of the Christian life is this distinction. And so some of you, you've been hearing it forever from me, and some of you are very new to the church. So just love each other and journey with me on this. What is an indicative? An indicative, in the Greek, it's, it's a statement of fact. It's truth. It's God's truth. And what I want you to get is that it's already done. It's not an imperative to you, go do it. Believe it. God did it. Believe Romans 1 through 5, to the one who does not work but believes in him who justifies the ungodly. To be justified, he's saying, believe it. It's been done for you. Christ has done it all. Don't go try to work out your salvation or work it out to get your salvation. Believe it. So catch this. All of Christian living is, is justified believers. 
And it's built off the indicative. So as you go live your Christian life, it's a therefore. You've got to believe one through five and know that you're accepted and loved and your performance isn't going to make God love you anymore as you start sanctification. You've got to settle that. And then, therefore, we will move forward and start living now the Christian life. This is one of the most important things that you don't miss. So catch this. Romans 6, 1 through 10 is all indicatives. It was like 16 or 17. I'll have to go count them again, but a bunch of indicatives. And things that already happened when you believed in Christ. (coughs) Every believer, this happened. And it's true of you, child of God, this morning, what we're going to look at, you died to sin. And the great news is you don't have to go do it. The worst command would be that you got to go die to sin when you were in Adam, because you could never do it. That's what Romans 1 through 3 was trying to show you. You can't, you can't do that. That's good news. It's done. You believe it, and now you reckon it to be true as you begin to live the Christian life. So if I could summarize these indicatives, it would be this, as Greg was talking about, is union with Christ. It's, it's not just you were tied to the coattails of Adam, and now you're tied to the coattails of Christ. But I want you to catch this. You get his very person. So you didn't get Adam's very person. That's why I kept saying much more than. Much more. You, you don't just get what Christ did, his, his obedience and, and his death. You get him. So I just want you to see that all the sanctification is you have union with Christ. You are married to him. You're joined. You're one with him when you believe this gospel. And so all of sanctification is going to be built off of you're in a marriage to Jesus Christ. You're in union with him. And so Romans 5, 12 through 21 is what we looked at. That some mighty things happened when you came into union with Christ. (coughs) <coughs> One act of obedience became yours, Jesus' life and death, but there is much more. And not just your standing and position with Christ changed, but your relationship to sin changed. Your standing. So I want you to catch this. Your boss, your mastery, your slavery was sin, and now it changed. And in the gospel now, there's a mastery, and your ruler and your king is Christ. Grace righteousness. Does this really matter? Pastor, I'm a lover, not a theologian. This matters. You won't be a lover if you don't understand this. And so you've got to get this. And it's worth wrestling with, and it's worth understanding, because I'm telling you, this is the foundation of your whole Christian life. And most of my counseling is people who try to start living the Christian life without settling Romans 1 through 5. It's got to be settled first. You can't start without it the obedience of faith, believe this gospel. Throughout this whole section, here's why I want you to see why this is important. Paul keeps saying this, knowing. Don't you know? He he doesn't say do. But understand a reality first and foremost. Look at Romans (coughs) 6.3. Sorry, I got a bad cough again today. Or do you not know? Look at verse 6. Knowing this. Look at verse 9. Knowing that Christ... 6.11, even so then, reckon, consider yourselves to be dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Then in verse 12, don't let sin reign in your mortal bodies. Don't present your members to sin. So knowing is what's going to guide our sanctification. So it leads to very practical Christian living and fighting against sin. So you got to begin with knowing. The first thing in sanctification is not doing. It's knowing then believing and reckoning these things to be true in your heart, then you go live in light of these realities. So I just can't tell you how important this is to the Christian life. So catch this. All ethical and moral instruction is based on the indicative, and it's empowered by the indicative. The indicative gives you affections for Christ and love to him. That's why if you love me, you will keep my commandments. How do you love Christ? Believe in the indicatives. And when you have faith in it and believe it, you're going to, you have a new heart that he talked about. And now I want to obey him. I'm empowered to live the Christian life because I love him and I love others. And so this is so crucial that, that we understand the indicative empowers the Christian life. That's why you can't skip it. Then you can live Romans 6, 12 through, through 13. It's not your job description or a new law. 
Don't do it based on what, do it based on what God has done for you in Christ Jesus in Romans 1 through 5. So that has to matter if you're dead. If it doesn't, you're dead in your trespasses and sins. And so that is all my theology in a nutshell. Romans 1 through 5 should make you love God and want to go obey him and have affections. And if you try to skip that, you will just keep burning out and drying up and get nowhere in your Christian life. It's a therefore. And I got to preach the gospel, Romans 1 through 5, to my heart every day and keep filling it. And it empowers me that I can't walk away from this and I can't quit. It just keeps saying, I want to live for the king. Without a therefore, the indicative is the foundation and the empower of the imperative. You will, if you don't have this, you'll just have a frustrated Christian life. You're just going to keep recommitting yourself. You're going to throw twigs in a fire. You're going to have spurts. You're going to walk away and come back. You're never going to get any traction in the Christian life. You're going to be praying a prayer again and again, getting baptized again and again. And I'm telling you this morning, God has something better. And what I just described is Christianity normative of America. We're not getting this. And in every you turn on Christian radio, and, it, and all we can sing about is I'm failing, I'm miserable, I'm dead, and i got to find a church with a pastor who tells me every week how bad he is. I don't find that anywhere in the Scriptures. And so what I, I want you to see is don't accept that as normative. What we're going to see in Romans 6 is God has designed something that's going to be conforming and changing and transforming us. And if you get this, it isn't going to be what I just described all of your days. This is what we must know. And I'm going to flush it out slowly and clearly for your good and your abounding joy. I, I want to be a minister for your joy is why I'm going so slow and making sure you understand this. This is what you must know. Here's what I had to learn the hard way, and I'm just going to spare you 20 years. You rest in the gospel and you live a holy life to God. And I was trying to live a holy life to God so that I could rest in the gospel. And I meet people who do it every day. And that's what I'm trying to pull that rug out from under you this morning because it's not a rug that will produce holiness. It'll just produce frustration and sorrow and coming short. So may God set us free for those who are trying to live imperatives so that they can rest in the indicative, the gospel. And Jesus said, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest for your soul. Take my yoke upon you, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. That's what he offers. And the, when you get the indicatives, man, it's, it's a joy to obey. It will change everything about you. And so if you're weary of trying to do all this in your own strength and under the law, Jesus is saying, come. Come to me. One last thing. I probably should be done, but I haven't even started. Oh, man. My commitment for 2021 is shorter introductions. Since I blew it, let's keep going, Phil. <laughs> One last thing, and I just, I say this because I love you guys. Holiness of life is lost in our age, especially in America. The world is manifesting their depravity more and more, and they're given over. What is happening is that the church is being conformed to its thinking and to its living. I'm watching it. Romans 12, 2 is where all this is going to lead. And he's going to say, don't be conformed to the thinking of this world, but be transformed or renewed in your mind. We're to be separate in the way we think, in the way we live, what we hope in, what our goals are, what our pursuits are, and what our dreams. Our hope is not a united America, but Christ united in glory forever. And it's a purifying hope. It'll make men and women and children holy. And, Paul, and Jesus said in the end days, they're going to get drowsy. And people are going to start sinning and falling away from God. And this is a wake up. Come live into this grace in which we stand to make us like Christ, that he will ultimately finish the job. And one day you're going to shine like the noonday sun in righteousness forever. Our whole being should be at war with sin. 
And so that's my prayer for this year. Is let's, let's not um, be at rest with sin. Let's not be at home with it or at peace with it. Have, have you made peace with it? McShane said, I want to be as holy as men and women can be this side of glory. So I want to have a determination to give myself to his means and have a dependence because I know only God can make me holy. And so that's my exhortation for us. And um, I'm going to pray. And I just got, I got to give you at least a little bit of the text before you go home. So sorry. Father, I pray. Lord, as we've set this diamond now in its right place, I pray that you would do mighty things in our midst. God, we want to be holy because you're holy. God, it's the whole end uh, that you are moving us to is victory over sin. You've taken care of the guilt. You're dealing with power, and we long for the day when the presence will be gone. But God, we need your power to overcome the power of sin. And so I, I pray that we will learn that that happens by being under grace, not by being under law. And there are some in this church who don't understand that, and I pray that you would set them free during this season. God, that we would learn we can come out from under law and be holy. That it's coming out from under it that's going to be the power. And so, Lord, meet us and do mighty things uh, in our midst. I pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. All right. Romans 6, 1 through 14. Whoever's back there, put up the outline. Paul's going to give us five truths concerning our release from the dominion of sin. And I just want you to know I allowed 10 minutes for Robin Conwell to pray at the end, and he couldn't make it. So we got 10 extra minutes. <laughs> Paul's going to give us five truths concerning our release from the dominion of sin. First, we're going to look at an antagonist that are always there and always will be against this free gospel. Then we're going to look to this morning. I do want to look at the axiom. I'll just give it to you in a general view, and then we'll dig in. In the following weeks, the argument is in verses 3 through 10, and then the attitude, reckon these things to be true, and then the application in verses 12 through 14. Don't, sin doesn't have any members of its own. Don't give yours to sin to go serve it. Give your members to Christ to be servants for righteousness. That's where we're going to end uh, the application. So antagonist, verse 1. What shall we say to one year of Romans 1 through 5? What should we say to that? Are we to continue in sin so that grace might increase? That's the one thing you shouldn't say to the last year. I pray there isn't one soul in this church saying that. Paul has preached this gospel of free grace long enough to know what his objectors would say about it. <clears throat> and probably all of us have come up against this question. Three chapters, there's nothing in us to merit God's salvation. Paul's been striving to show some 30 times it's all of God, it's by faith and not by works. There's nothing that can put us in a better posture to receive His grace. Not being a better person, nicer, reading your Bible. Grace comes to the most vile of sinners. In Romans 5.20, the law came so that transgression would increase and where it increased, grace engulfed it and swallowed it up. Yet hidden in every truth are the seeds of error. One man said, the fire which warms the hands has the latent capacity to burn down a city block. Truth is always that very careful trek through two monuments of error. And so here is the danger in the gospel of grace. When we preach free grace in all of its fullness, some will draw comfort from it when it is not their comfort. Here it will be those who say, let's sin that grace might abound. Free grace. I can live any way I want and it will glorify God because he'll forgive me. I'm just going to sin and, and exalt grace again and again. And it's alive today and it might be alive in your own heart. There's always two sides to fall off on with the gospel of grace. One is licentiousness and that's this. Let us go sin and live any way we want that grace might abound. And the other is legalism. If, if I preach such a free gospel, people are going to abuse it. And they're going to use it when it isn't theirs. 
And so I'm going to make sure that I keep telling you how obedient you got to be while I'm trying to share with you justification by faith in Christ alone. And I'll just keep adding it and make sure that you never just get the full free gospel. There's got to be some kind of law, some kind of performance. And so that's the other side that you can fall off on. D. Martin Lloyd-Jones, one of my favorite preachers, he said, true preaching will always lead to this charge. And so if you haven't been frustrated with me in the last year going, Pastor, you're making this too easy. <laughs> it's too free. Uh, I pray that you, a little of you were frustrated with that and, and saying that because it's so free and all completed in tetelestai. It's finished. It's done. It's your gospel. It's so free. And now we're going to see that, that, wait a minute, if it's that free, you can just go live any way you want. And, and if you don't preach it free enough, no one will ever accuse you of that. I've had some friends that are so protective of that, no one's ever accused them of it. But many of them are struggling in legalism and they can't find freedom. So I want you to take that into heart this morning. There's our, our first uh, antagonist. So here's our axiom and I'll send you home. <coughs> May it never be. May genoita. And it literally means, let it not be. God forbid. That's unthinkable. No way. I don't think you could say it any greater. It's impossible. That, if you got that out of Romans 1-5, through 5, you're dead in your sins. That can't be what happens to the believer's heart. Is, is this the goal of grace, to allow us to continue in sin? It's to deliver us from the bondage of sin and the reign of sin. God takes care of sin judicially, but he also does it practically. He imputes righteousness and he imparts righteousness. God puts us in the reign of grace. And this reign of grace, as he who began a good work, will complete it. He's going to complete the work in you. So for grace to increase, sin must decrease. The goal of grace is to destroy sin and so don't let such a thought ever enter into your mind. And Paul's going to drop the argument that we're going to be looking at for a few weeks. How shall we, who died to sin, still live in it? And the we is very emphatic. And I want you to catch it. How shall we, Romans 1-5 through 5, believers, how shall we, being what we are now in Christ, uh, sins forgiven, righteousness wrapped around us, born again, law put within our heart. How shall we, who have such a special position now, who have died to sin, how shall we, church of God, still live in it? How can you still live in it? That's Paul's argument. What, what comes to your mind when you hear this? I, I hope you're struggling with what I was struggling with all week. What comes to your mind when you hear that? Before I was saved, I didn't even know what sin was. Now I see it on every corner. If we've died to it, I must not be a Christian. That's the whole argument of this chapter. The whole argument hangs on this truth. This is the hinge that our sanctification turns on. And sanctification is where we, we live. It's not surprising then that there's a lot of confusion about this verse. And I'm going to clear up the confusion and let you go home. But before I do, just a couple thoughts. This died to sin is in the aorist tense. And it, it's a snapshot of an occurrence in the past. So I want you to catch, you died to sin in the past in a snapshot. And it's important to our translation this morning. It's not a present tense. You're dying to sin. That's going to be later in Romans 8. This is this principle of, of what you were in Adam. <coughs> You're not dying to sin. It's not an imperfect, which is like a motion picture instead of a, a snapshot. And it's not a future that one day you will die to sin. It's an aorist. Important. So here are the five misinterpretations, most common ones of this passage, and then I'll give you the true one and bless you with, with a benediction. The first one is the Christian is no longer responsive to sin. What is it that most characterizes a dead body? Their senses cease, cease to operate. They no longer respond to stimuli. And now what it's saying is you're unresponsive to sin. <clears throat> we do not feel or respond to temptation. 
It's what we would call perfectionism. And I pray that everyone in here would just say that's untrue. <laughs> Why would you command uh, in verse 12 or verse yeah 12, therefore don't let sin reign in your mortal body and obey its lusts uh, if you have no response to it. It's a fight. It's still there. And so right there, that is not a true translation. The second is that the Christian should die to sin. And, and you run around your whole Christian life trying to die to what you were in Adam, sin. You need to crucify the old man to have victorious living. And there's people writing all books and programs how to do that. And the problem, it begins with man and not with God. You can't crucify yourself. The verb tense is all wrong, but we do urge don't let sin reign in your mortal body. Third, the Christian should die to sin day by day. And again, it's not an imperfect where it would be you're dying to sin. It's an aorist. And the fourth is that the Christian has renounced sin. And that could fit with the aorist when you believed in Christ. We, we made a firm renunciation of sin. And the problem is it still puts us dying to sin as something that we do. Paul is saying that this is something that has been done to us. It's an indicative. God took us from the coattails of Adam, and by grace, he joined us to Christ. You died. You died to sin. And so what happened here is why we can't continue in sin. So because God's work uh, continuing in sin is unthinkable, is what he's arguing. And fifthly, the Christian has died to sin's guilt. We, we've died to the guilt of sin is what it's talking about. That's true, but that's not what this passage is talking about. Paul is saying we can no longer live in sin as believers. It doesn't answer the question. That's not what he's talking about. And the other is we die to sin in a future tense, in an eschatological view. When we get to heaven, we will die to sin, and it's not a future tense either. So what is it? You died to sin. Stay in the context. What you were in Adam in the reign of sin. And it ruled you, and it reigned you. And it was a dominion. And when you were in Adam, you were in slavery to sin. We were in Romans 1 through 3 that we studied for so long. And we were controlled and dominated by sin. And so Paul Stanley boldly stands up. And I want you to hear this. We died to that ruler. Arist, we died to it. That monarch has been defeated. The tyranny of sin has been broken. We died to the reign of it. And we now live under a different sovereign, the Lord Jesus Christ, the new king, our new ruler, and our new master. We are under the reign of grace. And I love to be reigned by grace because he's the gracious one. The one whose burden is easy and his yoke is light. The one who's full of grace and truth now rules us. I'm not under the power and reign of sin anymore. I died to it. And Paul's going to say, you've got to reckon this to be true. I'm under the rule and reign of grace. Our Lord's death and resurrection brought the reign of sin to an end for the believer. And if I'm in Christ, I'm dead to the reign of sin and its realm and its rule and its tyranny. And at the moment I'm saved, justification and regeneration, when we become Christians, hear this, we are dead to that reign of sin that when we were in Adam. I think that's probably the best news you could ever hear. You're dead to that rule. And I just one important note, Douglas Moo, the commentator, said, though belonging to a new realm, the believer brings with him many of the impulses, habits, and tendencies of the old life when you were in Adam. Thus, until glory, there will still be effects from the old Adamic dominion. And so as I've always said, sin is no longer reigning, but it's still remaining. The power of sin has been broken, not its presence. And that's why we have indicatives and imperatives. Sin will not be master over you. Don't let sin reign. And so what we see is we're either under the rule of sin or the rule of grace. In Adam or in Christ, there's no in-between. We are uh, believers. We are dead to the rule and realm of sin that we lived when we were in Adam. We are no longer in Adam. We're in Christ. We died to that life of dominion of sin. And we can no more go back to it than Jesus going back and suffering and dying again for sin. 
We died to it the way Christ died to it, and we will look at that next week. And so do you see the foolishness of um, Romans 6, 1? You've died. To sit and say, can I keep living like I did when I was in Adam so that grace might abound? He says that, that's foolishness. You, you've died to that realm. And this is why every testimony is, this is what I was in Adam. And the grace of God has come, and now I walk in newness of life. And I can't be what I was when I was in Adam. So it's not perfection, but it's a direction. But you, you, just, you can't start sanctification until you realize you're not under that any longer. You don't have to be controlled and dominated by sin any longer. Most people I meet, that you believe that these sins have to own you and they have to control you. And Paul's going to say, you've got to reckon to your heart that sin doesn't rule you anymore. We come to fight defeated sin. It's already been forgiven. And this is going to be crucial to the Christian life that we understand this. So it's like a, a pauper a beggar being adopted by the king. You don't need to eat worms anymore or a butterfly still trying to be a caterpillar. <laughs> That's us going back to what we were in Adam. It doesn't work anymore, does it? You ever try to go back to what you were in Adam? It's miserable. It, I don't belong there anymore. It's not even me anymore. A death is always dramatic. It's a transfer from one realm to another. You've died to what you were in Adam and now you're made alive to God in Christ. So I'll close with, why do we still sin? And Rick Anderson gave me the best illustration I've come across. He said that the slaves during the Civil War, when the proclamation of emancipation came, there were some who had been slaves all of their lives since birth. And, and, and they, they heard slavery is abolished, Romans 6. And so the, their old masters, they would be walking down the street and they would hear their voice and, and they would tremble and, and oh, I got to serve him. I got to obey him because that's all they've ever known. And they forgot that the law has changed. You've been set free and that's no longer your master. You don't have to listen to him any longer. Quit listening to that slave. You're done. You've been emancipated. That's sanctification. I don't have to listen to that guy any longer. Satan's done with me. What I was when I was controlled by sin has been broken. And now I'm under the reign of grace that can begin to change and transform and give me victories over sins that I could never overcome when I was in Adam. Oh my, what a gospel. What a hope. It's a thorough salvation, not just justification so you can live any way you want that sin might abound. Don't fall for that. It's a powerful gospel that delivers from sin, from one degree of glory to the next, that by the grace of God will not be stopped and you will make it to glory where you will no longer battle sin forever. What a promise. So I'm going to close with one last word. As you might have came in here all excited to worship and it was your day of visitation that your whole life has been a lie and there's, there's no change you're the same person that you were when you were in Adam and you've, you're moral you go to church you say nice things you've memorized some creeds that's not salvation and what you need is not Romans 6 but you need Romans 1 through 5 because you've got to come out from Adam. You've got to die to that rule and reign of sin that has held you all of your days. And so I'm holding up Christ to you this morning. That maybe Romans 6, I, I tried to tutor you with the law, all these different things that we've looked at. And maybe now Romans 6, you'll realize I'm, there's no change in my life. I'm the exact same guy I was 20 years ago. And so I'm not talking about battling sin and still having sin. I'm talking about when it ruled and reigned you. Have you been set free from that dominion? And the only way you can is to come with nothing in your hands and simply to thy cross I cling. And so Christ is a savior from sin all the way. It's justification, sanctification, and glorification. And he offers himself to be that to you. And so let's 
go journey. And for those who don't know this, let's keep learning it and be praying for each other and helping each other to not live in that old dominion, to not be like those slaves. When the devil says you got to do something, you obey it. You don't have to anymore. I want you to quit buying that lie and reckon this to be true. Man, I'm dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. That's where sanctification begins, and only God can do that. No human can do that. So if you're just trying to change yourself, it's futile. You can't change that. Only the power of grace can take you from one realm to the next. That's why I love Christ. What a ruler. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for our ruler. I thank you that we're in the realm of grace. You put your law within our heart. We love our master. We want to obey him. We want to serve him. And the greatest frustration of our life is how far short we come from these new, sanctified, beautiful desires that you've given us. And so, Father, our reach does exceed our grasp, and yet you're changing us and transforming us from one image of glory to the next. And I'm praying, God, empower us, change us, help defeated believers to, to, to reckon this to be true and transform and change them. God, I thank you for the beautiful word that we have here in Romans. Do mighty things in our midst in the days ahead. Bless these saints who stayed awake for their pastor being long-winded. God, please bless them and encourage them and let this go deep and change and transform them, I do pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.